Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Atelstan Fitzgerald Holder. The first! <laughs> yeah. You know, there's a historical legacy behind my name. Ironically, it, it, there's a lot of negative connotation applied here because my mom named me after the first king of England who ruled in 927 to 937 BC. He was a vigilante, you know, he was a, what they call, Anglo-Saxon. Imperialist. My mom named me after him. How you will name her? How you will name her? A black person after an imperialist mom. Come on, mom. My mom was infatuated with the aesthetic appeal because his name was spelled A T H E L S T O N. Mine does not have an H. She was caught up in the aesthetics of the name rather than the, the political, imperialistic, or the colonialistic undertone. But nevertheless, I'm still intrigued that I have this kind of um, aesthetic imperialism in my blood. Yeah. If, I'm an, if, I have, if I have European aesthetic imperialism in my blood, that will ironically make me a self-hating Negro. Nevertheless, that's not the whole objective of this paper, no. I'd like to... Uh, I introduce myself, right? I tell Stan Fitzgerald. Yeah, by the way, I'm a comedian performing tonight. I perform all over LA, you know. So, I'd like to discuss something very intriguing, you know, like uh, quantum mechanics on a molecular level. Okay, I, I, I'd like to talk about... Um, Particles, infinitesimally small particles, and uh, the ambiguity. Listen to this, right? Listen to this. Based. What the freaking noise? Is it too loud? Is it too loud here? An electron. First, you begin. You have a proton and a neuron. Proton, neuron. We're talking about the subatomic level now. We deal with particles on a molecular level. Proton, neurons binds together, forming something called a nucleus. I think I've discussed this in previous videos, you know. Proton new neurons bind together, forming the nucleus. Spiraling miles away relative to the size of the atom is the electron. Now, based on our, what's his name? Heisenberg. Heisenberg was a, a physicist, I think a Danish. Don't hold it against me, you know. Part of the Copenhagen interpretation. I'll explain what the Copenhagen... Copen Put your freaking thoughts together, dude! Part of the Copenhagen's interpretation is something I'm going to explain later. But based on Heisenberg's theory of uncertainty, it says that an electron spirals, right? Just the mere observ observ ob observance, just the mere observation of a particle changes its, its location. The electron, the dynamics of the electron is changed sporadically based on the obs ob 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 observation of the ob observer. That is an intriguing phenomenon because that defies the laws, the fundamental laws that, that, that constricts our reality. What's intriguing is Niels Bohr now was a Danish, I think in Danish physicist, uh, theoretical, I think, in 1927. 20, 26, 27, or 28. One of those years. Don't hold it against me. What he posits is that an electron, not an electron, a proton, acts as both wave and particle. Right? So they cannot be observed simultaneously, but they could only look, they can only be observed in the, in, um, independently, but they cannot be, be viewed simultaneously. And you could equate that to, um, here's a perfect aesthetic visual analogy. There's this pervasive image online. And be, the more, probably one of the most predominantly pervasive online um, ambiguous image where you have two black faces facing each other but between the two black faces there's an hourglass now you could view the hourglass or you could view the black faces but they cannot be observed simultaneously now that is a primary um, analogical correlation you can use to explain um, light acting as both wave and particle but this is not what I want to get into no. not Heisenberg theory, theory of uncertainty by the way Niels Bohr posited the, the, the concept the theory of complementarity where light and wave both work simultaneously it's kind of somewhat created an equilibrium or uh, synthesis you know all not an equilibrium is right when two opposing forces balances the equation you know like the protagonist versus the antagonist and at some given point you know, you know the, the, the movie they, you know, they, 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 they collaborate for a much higher, higher, higher cause. The objective of this was to get into something called quantum entanglement, where I think the guy's name was um, Schrodinger, another physicist, where he, where he um, postulated the idea of when quantum entanglement occurs, two mutually of uh, particles that spiral, spirals in contrasting directions, there's a correlation, meaning that on a funder, there's a there's a there's a there's a there's a synchronicity on a subatomic level between between particles, regardless of their distance. There's a camaraderie. There's like a rapport, meaning that when you affect one, it affects the other. Then there's something called super um, superposition. Superposition is when an atom or particles could be both dead or alive at the same time. That is intriguing phenomenon, you know. How much minutes have I used? 
Oops, make it too dark. Hold on. Those are quite intriguing phenomena. Hold on. Hold on. Come on, come on, light. Come on. Where's the freaking light? I, I know that I'm black, but I'm not that black. I'm not black, black, black. Right. Hold on, fix this. Hold on, guys. Let me fix this, man. Let me fix this. Come on, stupid camera. Right, hold on. Let's get more light. Hold on. What I can, you know, what intrigues me the most to dynamics. Hold on. This is not right. This is not right. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay, hold on. I'm so sorry, people. This is so unprofessional. This is so freaking. What your stupid eye? This eye back dumb. There we, there we go. There we go. There we go. There we go. It's me at Telstan Fitzgerald. So, uh, I, 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 I lost track. Let's talk about thermodynamics, the three the laws of thermodynamics. Because you know, thermodynamics was the driving force in the Industrial Revolution, you know, back in the 1900s. Why did the smallest car have to make the loudest stinking noise? And the car ugly with the big nasty rims. Thermodynamics was the driving force in the, in the, in the Industrial Revolution in the, 19, the 19th century. In fact, let's proceed back to the 18th century because the first Industrial Revolution was in Europe. And then, you know... And there's this chain tandem industrial revolution that spread across. It just promulgated the entire world. But let's primarily look at the 19th century industrial revolution in the United States. Not the United States. The, insect, the industrial revolution, man, and the steam engine. The driving force behind the steam engine. The steam engine was... The, what? 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 I feel like I'm becoming redundant and regurgitating the same bullshit. Why am I being so monotonous? The steam engine was the driving force in the industrial revolution. Primarily in the 19th century, preceding all the way back. What's intriguing, not so much about the steam engine or the Industrial Revolution, what was the, the three laws of thermodynamics which state that energy cannot be, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be con, con, transformed into different forms of energy. Right? The second law of um, thermodynamics talks about the uh, um, energy breaking down and disperses into random, dispersing or dissipating into random useless energy. Well, not primarily useless, because I don't like the word useless in the arbitrary sense, but within the context of... Um, from concentrated to less concentrated and what they found during the era of the designing of steam engine they were trying to find ways to 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 to, to, to create it basically basically energy basically is this energy is a conversion of work i'll use let me use a real trivial mundane example every so everyone can encapsulate encapsulate this concept of what exactly exa exactly energy relates to within the second law of thermodynamics and how it's how it's applicable Let's say, hypothetically, okay, this is the second law of thermodynamics. I use energy in my vocabulary is conducive to, to, to energy. I'm, I'm exerting energy. And when this energy leaves my mouth, it dissipates and disperses into the air. It's useless energy, right? And then I have to eat an apple when I eat apple. So that, that is like the second law. Say where energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transformed into different forms. The second law is intriguing because it talks about energy, again, disperses dissipating into random, not random, so what useless or less usable energy, concentrated to less, to less um, concentrated. And this is where thermodynamics came into play because it helped them understand how to maximize or capitalize, get the most efficiency out of steam engine during the Industrial Revolution. And this was kind of like the spawn of thermodynamics. And then you have the, the, um, the entropic principle, primarily a subset of the second law of thermodynamics, which deals with um, predicting the probability of dispersed energy. It's the equivalent of you cooking. You're cooking. You're cooking. You're cooking, bitch, in your house. I'm not a misogynist. I'm just trying to spice up the conversation, right? And, and, and when the water boils, it's conservation energy. When the water boils and the heat evaporates, it disperses, right? Less concentrated energy. This hence to hence the idea of the entropical, entropical principle, where the, they're predicting the probabilities of this space, dispersed energy always offsets conservation energy, which will automatically lead into futuristic, cataclysmic um, self obliteration of the earth, which is a whole different philosophical discussion I refuse to get into. So, so. What, what, what was the conversation about? We were discussing, um, we were discussing um, quantum entanglement 
the relationship between subatomic particles and a molecular level, regardless of their distance, we are talking about the theory of complementarity, the uncertainty principle, and primarily thermodynamics, and the relationship and the role it plays in the Industrial Revolution. Right? You want to understand what the Industrial Revolution is? Just look at the um, computers. Right? Right? The information revolution was contingent on um, on um, on um, computers. Computers was 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 the driving force in the information revolution, right? And then you could proceed back to the steam engine being the driving force in the industrial revolution because what steam engine and industrial revolution do it was replace man and animal power, right? So uh, I do apologize for you know sporadically covering a variety of you know, um, mutually exclusive subject and none particular. They, they're kind of the, within the context of physics. Actually, you know, the thermodynamics was the, was the underlying... What's that? What's that? Thermodynamics helped them understand the underlying principle that governed the relationship between heat, heat and how it oscillates between um, system. And, and then, of course, the industrial revolution, that was a spawn of capitalism because it, no, it, was no, it was no free market. No, we deal with free market and you were being rewarded for your innovation. And then you have capitalism. And that was kind of like the rise of capitalism and, well, somewhat. By the way, thermodynamics or the concept or the idea kind of existed long before. No? I think it kind of um, it, it became more ubiquitous because steaming engine... And um, yeah, there was a like there's a synthesis. Synthesis is when there's a unified whole of two mutually exclusive parts. All right, and thesis, antithesis, and synthesis is a whole different subject we like to get into. But it's kind of like an equilibrium also, where thesis, antithesis is the opposing or the contrast of thesis, and synthesis is where there's a unified whole between the thesis and the antithesis, creating a unified whole of muti muti um, mutually exclusive parts. But could also spring forth, right? Uh, 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 uh an ingenious resolution that is unrelated to the synthesis, to the thesis or the antithesis. Com completely different, mutually exclusive from an equilibrium. But, 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 I, I, I need to put my thoughts together so we could discuss things more. You know what we're going to discuss next time? Capitalism, socialism, communism, um, utopia, and the uh, political undertone in the matrix because I found there's a, I found there, I found there's a major it is an intriguing cultural, sociological, economical, and political di dichotomy in the matrix between the Zion, right, and the matrix. Ironically, they were both, they were two simulations. Although Neo was the anomaly, and he was the seventh anomaly of his predecessors, right? But we'll discuss that. We like to discuss what predicate all these political innuendos in the movie. So... That's it. I tell Stan Fitzgerald, hold on, the first sign, you know, I'm going to perform tonight, man. I'm going to do comedy. Get ready, people. You should come and see me in Hollywood, and I'm a comedian now. Yeah. That is all. I am finished now. Pull my bow tie. Because I'm freaking, I'm, I'm freaking, I'm freaking, I'm, in, I'm intelligent. I'm intelligent. I'm freaking intelligent, yo. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm cute. Goodbye.